And everybody said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your people, your servants, our pastors and leaders. Thank you for bringing us together again to develop us, lift us up, encourage us, and challenge us too. We're asking, Lord, that your word will find appropriate place in every heart tonight in Jesus' name. And your word will bear fruit in every life. Clear away anything in our hearts, anything in our habits that hinders fruit bearing in Jesus' name. Be with every one of your people tonight. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to Jude, only one chapter, chapter one, and I'm reading from verse three. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That latter part, it was needful. It was necessary. I was compelled by the Spirit of God. There was a pressure in the inner man that I shall write unto you and drill it into you that you in particular as a minister should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Tonight we are looking at the message, the charge to earnestly contend for the faith. The charge to earnestly contend for the faith. In First Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. You are given a charge and you pass on the charge to those under your leadership. Charge them that they teach no other doctrine. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God. It's not a charge private between the apostle and the pastor Timothy. This is in the sight of God and in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ the charge comes and he will judge the quick, the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. This is the charge. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort without long suffering and doctrine. Here's the reason for the church. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, desires, superficial affection for the word, for the ministry, they shall heed to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. That's the reason for the church. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Why is the church coming? 
because Christ himself has told us that at the end of time, near the end of time, when he will come again, there will not be a revival of truth, a revival of sound doctrine, a revival of upright living. There will be a revival of corruption, a revival of compromise, a revival of disobeying the gospel and falling away. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many near the end of the time as the Lord is coming again. And that time draws near. It says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 24. In verse 24, near the time of the coming of Christ, here is what will be happening. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's why the church is coming afresh, coming anew, and coming to you, coming to me, coming to everyone. That this is the time to lift up the standard, raise up the standard, and earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Verse 25, Behold, I told you before. Verse 34, Verily, verily, verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The Lord is telling us, there's not going to be any new doctrine from Christ. Anything he didn't say before, anything he didn't teach before, anything the Spirit of God had not emphasized, he said there's nothing new coming from heaven. If anything appears to be new, it's coming from Satan, the enemy of the truth. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. There's going to be a deviation, a departure from the truth very near the time of the coming of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I read from verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. A falling away from the truth, a falling away from sound doctrine will take place and then the Lord will come to gather together and to take home the people who are standing and the people who are earnestly contending for the faith once for all delivered unto the saints. It says, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the reason we are to hold fast what we already have. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me 
in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus that good thing the faith once delivered unto the saints that good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us Jude verse 3 Jude chapter 1 verse 3 it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The church to earnestly contend for the faith. Three things we're looking at, three subtitles. Number one, personally comprehending the faith delivered unto the saints. You must hear it. You must understand it. You must believe it. You must have accepted it. You must have committed yourself to preaching it. Before now, you can have the charge earnestly contained for the faith, personally comprehending the faith delivered unto the saints. Point number two, passionately contending for the faith declared by the Savior. The faith, the body of truth, the doctrine, the teaching, the totality and entirety of the truth that Christ emphasized and that he said when the Holy Ghost has come, he will reveal all things unto you which has been revealed in the epistles. Now, passionately contending for that faith declared by the Savior. Point number three, perseveringly, not getting tired, permanently, not doing it and leaving it off, perseveringly conserving the faith defined in the scriptures is delineated in the scriptures it's described in the scriptures it's revealed to us in the scripture and perseveringly conserving the faith defined described delineated in the scriptures come to point number one personally comprehending the faith delivered unto the saints. Jude, verse 3, beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, that's the salvation common to everyone, salvation available for everyone, salvation for the Jews and the Gentiles, salvation for the first century and all the centuries until Christ will come. The same salvation through the same Savior provided by the same cross at Calvary. I give all diligence with all my heart and with all my desires, with everything I have within me, not reserving any of my skill, any of my strand, any of my knowledge for another thing. I brought everything I've got together and I give all diligence to write unto you of this important, necessary salvation available for everyone. It says it was needful, necessary for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, we must comprehend before we can contend. How are you going to contend for something, 
fight for something, defend something you don't even understand. You must comprehend. We cannot contend for and we cannot defend what we don't understand or comprehend. First, we must be convinced of the faith. If you're not convinced, you cannot go out and put your life on the line and then enter into dangerous territories and contend when you are not convinced. Number one, you must be convinced of the faith. Number two, you must be converted to the faith. How would you endanger your life? And go to the Gentiles and go to the religious people and go to those who will imprison you if they could. How would you go to them and tell them of the faith of salvation, the faith of holiness, the faith of the total truth of the word of God if you are not converted to it yourself? How can you endanger your life to contain for such a faith? You must be convinced of the faith. You must be converted to the faith. You must be committed to the faith. You cannot give yourself wholeheartedly. You cannot give yourself internally and outwardly. You cannot give yourself in the face of danger to any sin and contend for that sin if you are not really internally committed to that faith as the only way of salvation. How would you be impressing it on members of your family when you know they are totally religious too, they go to one kind of church too, they read the Bible too, but you know that they have not been converted and if they go on like this, if the Bible is true, if truly without holiness no man shall see the Lord as I see these people, although they profess religion, there's no way they can get to heaven if the Bible is true. If you are not committed to the faith as the only way of salvation, there's no way you're going to contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You must be confident and certain of the completeness and the sufficiency of the faith. If you don't believe that what you have is sufficient and it is complete, if you think you have only a part of the truth, and maybe that other side has a part of the truth, and that other denomination has a part of the truth. If you are not confident and certain of the faith once delivered unto the saints that it is complete, it is sufficient, sufficient for everything we need on earth and sufficient to take us to heaven. If you are not that confident, you cannot honestly contend for that faith. If you are not counting the faith greater than your life, you cannot spill your blood, you cannot lose your friends, you cannot lose money, you cannot lose anything that you count higher than the faith. It is when you come to the understanding and you count the faith the body of truth, the doctrines, the word, the Bible, the commission that were given, and that this way of salvation is higher, is greater than any other thing you possess on earth. That's the only time you can give up all those things if they want to take them, they can take them the honor you have from people, the prestige you have on earth, and the whatever it is other people are running after, if you don't have the conviction that the faith is higher above any other sin on earth, 
there's no way you will earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. There must be a comprehension. There must be a conviction. There must be a conversion. There must be a commitment. There must be a consecration. And there must be a confidence. There must be counting all things dung and draws. Before now you can say, I'm earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. But what's he talking about when he says the faith? The faith. Look at that verse again. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. What's the faith? Acts chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 7. Acts chapter 6. Reading from verse 7. In verse 7, And the word of God God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith the faith he calls it in the first part of verse 7 the word of God the word of God the word of God. And at the latter part of that verse, it refers to that word of God as the faith. Look at Acts chapter 13, the faith. Acts chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 7. Acts chapter 13, verse 7. Which was of the deputy of the country, such as Paulus, a prudent man, who called Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn the deputy away from the faith the faith in verse 7 is the word of God that the man the deputy wanted to hear in verse 8 it's referred to as the faith Acts chapter 14 in Acts chapter 14 verse 21 Acts 14 verse 21 it says and when they had preached the gospel the word of God, the gospel to that city, and I taught many. They returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. What they taught them was the word of God, was the gospel. And now they wanted them to continue in that word of God. And in verse 22, it's referred to as the faith. Acts chapter 16. Reading from verses 4 and 5. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep. The words that were written down referred to as decrees because the messengers taking that word to the gentile churches must not change any word any syllable and any judge in that word they add it's a decree a decree from heaven a decree that passed on to the hands of the apostles the reaching word that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So, and so were the churches established in the faith. The decrees, the words that were delivered unto them established them. And it established them in the word, established them in the faith. The faith is a totality of the word delivered unto us. 
Acts chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 24 and verse 25. Acts chapter 24, verse 24. After certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. The faith in Christ. Verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come. That's part of the faith. He wanted to hear concerning the faith. And Paul, in bringing the faith unto him, spoke of righteousness. Self-righteousness will not do. Only the righteousness of Christ imputed, imparted unto us will do. Only the righteousness of faith will do. And then after that, we accept that, we receive that, and we live in the righteousness that is greater than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And temperance, bringing everything under control, under temperance, the members of your body, your tongue, your eyes, everything. And then there's a judgment to come. Felix trembled hearing about the faith. If it were just paid to get healed, there's nothing to tremble about that. If it's a faith to get money, prosperity, there's nothing to tremble for concerning that. But he had the faith, the word of God. And he trembled and said, Go thy way this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Colossians chapter 1 verse 23 Colossians chapter 1 verse 23 if ye continue in the faith if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel it's talking about the faith and now he calls it the gospel which ye have heard the word the counsel of God, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. That's the faith. Come back to Jude, chapter 1, verse 3. It says in Jude, verse 3, it says here, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The word delivered. It was delivered unto the saints. And those saints have kept the faith, preserved the faith, established the faith and now they have passed it on to us and it is ours to continue and to contain and to preserve the faith which was once delivered delivered to the saints not delivered to the sinners so the sinners cannot come to a round table well, the saints and say, let's discuss this faith. You have no part in this. It's not delivered to the unbelievers. So the unbelievers cannot say, let's come to a round table and talk about this faith. You have no part in this. It's not delivered to religious people who have not been converted, who have not been changed, and who are not saints of God. And so religious people and society cannot come to us and say, let's sit down and discuss this and tell you and tell one another what we can preach that will make us feel we're united that we are one you have no part in this it was delivered unto the saints and those saints passed it on to saints and the saints of today have got it and the saints of today, if they're going to pass it on, they pass it on to saints. We don't pass it on to sinners. Sinners cannot take 
the word, the faith, and go and preach it to all the people. The delivered unto the saints. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. For as much as many are taken in hand to set forth in order the declaration of those things which are surely believed among us, those things from repentance to being born again to restitution to righteousness to the standard of the word of god on christian living to who a new creature is in christ to christ our sufficiency the captain of our salvation to christ who was born of virgin mary and to for christ who lived a sinless life and the Christ who gave us all the teachings of the new covenant. Christ who went to Calvary. Christ who had to share his blood for our salvation. The things that are surely believed among us. The Christ who rose from the dead. And the Christ who appeared to his own disciples by many infallible proofs. All those 40 days. The Christ that ascended to heaven. The Christ that spoke about hell and he spoke about heaven. The Christ that spoke about the rapture. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I will come again to receive you. The Christ that spoke about the great tribulation. When you see all those abominations reaching by Daniel, take note that the end is near. The Christ that spoke about his second coming. The Christ that spoke about his reign. is reigning in his kingdom. And the Christ that spoke about hell which is eternal and hell heaven which is eternal the things that are most assuredly believed among us look at verse 2 even as they delivered them unto us delivered unto the saints the total word the complete word the entire revelation delivered unto us which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world delivered unto us Romans chapter 6 verse 17 the faith the body of truth the teaching the totality of doctrines was delivered unto the saints Romans chapter 6 verse 17 but God beside that she was servants of sin but have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you delivered to you that's the faith that's the word it was delivered first Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 first corinthians 11 verse 2 now i praise you brethren that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as i delivered them to you you are keeping the ordinances as i delivered them unto you you are not modifying you are not changing first corinthians chapter 15 reading from verse 1 moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you which also ye have received and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved if ye keep in memory what i preached unto you unless ye have believed in vain for i delivered unto you it's delivered totally entirely completely without selecting sitting and choosing 
it says for i delivered unto you first of all that which i also received i received it from the lord and i delivered that unto you then he goes on and he tells us about what he had delivered unto them the faith is all the counsel of god is the whole revelation of the holy scriptures we are told in second timothy chapter 3 reading from verse 14 second timothy chapter 3 verse 14 but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them the totality of the truth you have learned knowing of whom you have learned them and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in christ jesus all scripture you see now that was he delivered and that's what is encouraging us earnestly contending for the faith for the body of truth delivered unto us all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable unto for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of god may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works point number two point number two passionately contending for the faith declared by the savior we come to jude and i'm reading from verse three jude verse three beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints passionately contending for the faith declared by the savior look at that word there earnestly contend earnestly contend the word earnestly seriously passionately that is you are to contend for this not half-heartedly not sluggishly not with half of your strength not as if you are dozing almost sleeping not in, as if you are forgotten the details of that face and you are just beating about the bush you do this earnestly that means number one seriously that means number two passionately that means number three wholeheartedly your heart is into this your mind is into this your blood is into this earnestly wholeheartedly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints it means unwaveringly you are not moved by any challenge you are not blown around by any wind that blows you are sure you are confident and because of that you contend unwaveringly it means number five zealously zealously if you are ever zealous about anything at all and you are awakened and you put everything you've got and the zeal consumes you this is the one area you must zealously contend it means courageously if you're not courageous and the people you are talking to and the people you are contending with to preserve the faith if they see that you are not courageous you are fearful you're timid and you're not putting everything you've got into it 
they'll not believe you. You contend courageously. Seven, you contend uncompromisingly. They will tell you that, all right, we accept it up to this point, but no further. Now, Moses, how many will go with you? And Moses replied, All we have in the land will go with us. Now, Moses, take care of yourself. Your men can go, your women can go, take your children along too. That and no more. And Moses replied, All the animals, everything we have in this land, were taken out. Not a hoof will remain uncompromisingly. That you know that there is no literal part of the doctrine, there is no redundant part of the faith, there is nothing that you say, okay, for the sake of unity, for the sake of understanding, we give up that, we're quiet on that, we'll not emphasize that anymore. You contain for the faith uncompromisingly. Number eight, you, com you contain for the faith effectively. If you go to the battle, you say you have gone to war, which war. If you come back defeated, you have not waged war. All the, the other people have waged the war and they have crushed you and they have silenced you. You must contain effectively and you must contain convincingly. Your words must be convincing. The tone of your voice must be convincing. Your stand, your look, your posture must be convincing. You stand for the truth. And you say, this is the way and it's the only way that takes us to heaven. Even the way you say it must be convincing. You say it, you contain convincingly. And you contain constantly, constantly. You're not tired until your blood is now cold in your body and you don't have any voice and you are passed on to the other side. You keep on contending constantly, fearlessly. If you fear the enemy, he'll take advantage of that. He'll push his false doctrine down your throat. But you contend fearlessly and you contend faithfully. He who strives for the mastery must strive lawfully, faithfully. Look at that verse again. Jude, verse 3, beloved, he's talking to all believers not only ministers, and he's talking to us, of course, in particular the ministers. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend the word contend. Fight. You fight to keep the faith. You fight Satan. You fight the evil spirits. You fight the principalities and powers. You fight the agents of Satan. You fight religious people who are sent to make you dilute and compromise the faith. Fight to keep. You battle to preserve. It's a battle. Look at the children of Israel. As they fought and contended for their territory, their territorial integrity, they will not compromise. And it says they contended. You are battling to preserve. Contend, it means to defend against corruption. There are people that will want to corrupt the word of God. There are people that will want to corrupt the teaching of the word of God. They want to give us half gospel. Half gospel is false gospel. If you remove repentance from the gospel and you leave the faith there, 
the people don't know what to believe. If there is no conviction for sin, there will be no true repentance and the faith will not be real. Therefore, you defend the faith against corruption. You protect from the enemies. There are enemies of righteousness. Anytime they hear the word doctrine, anger rises up in them. And they say, if we're going to be friends, if we're going to walk together, you must stop using this word. That word gives them stomach ache. That word makes them feel there can be no unity if there is doctrine. Jesus adds doctrine. And the doctrine he has passed on to us. The Pharisees even had doctrines. And Jesus said, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. Paul the Apostle emphasized doctrine. Was doctrine the doctrine of salvation? The doctrine of righteousness? The doctrine of sanctification? The doctrine of marriage? One man, one wife, until death do you part? Yes, there's doctrine and you want to protect the doctrines from the enemies of the faith. Number five, to contend means to maintain the faith at all costs. To maintain the faith at all costs. You lose friends. That's the cost. Let them go. You lose people that will say, we used to appreciate him. We used to love him. We used to honor him. But now he's so strong-minded and he's so narrow-minded. He keeps to the Bible alone and he's not sinner-friendly. It's not denomination friendly. It's not that friendly. It's not like a salesman that will show you this side and not show you this side. But to contend and maintain the faith at all costs. What does it mean to contend? Shield the faith from antichrists. There are many antichrists that have gone into the world. They are anti-Christ, anti-Christian, anti-doctrine, anti-righteousness, anti-holiness. It says we are to shield the faith from anti-Christ. We are to watch against contamination. We are to watch against any drop of poison to come into the glass, into the cup of pure water. What to watch against contamination. To contain, what does that mean? Gurge the faith with your very life. That's what it means. That you're earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You gurge the faith with your very life. And it also means you stand up, stand up, stand up against subtle attacks subtle attacks there are people when they joke there are people when they make fun there are people in their paws the only thing they know is to joke about holiness they pronounce it a particular way sanctification they pronounce that a particular way and they say you know I'm sanctified and because I'm sanctified now, I don't eat meat. They're just trying to cast it at you, throw it at your face. They use the serious words, sacred words of scripture in a jocular manner to make, to make jest and to ridicule. And you must stand up against subtle attacks. To contend means you keep secured from intruders. Intruders that would like to come. That's why you protect your house with electronic gadgets. You protect the house with even human security. So that intruders will not come in to take anything. To contend means you watch off threatened danger. 
there's a danger of losing this and losing this and losing this until everything becomes shallow and empty and your word of threatened danger anything that will erode into your faith and into the faith anything that will erode into the stand of on the word of god you what of the stretching erosion you save god taking precautionary protective measures you don't wait until the thieves come you take precautionary protective measures you safeguard the faith so that nobody will come and then pollute and then destroy what we have got by the grace of god we will do it earnestly courageously unflinchingly totally with the whole heart we will contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints in Jesus' name. I'm waiting for a good amen. amen. Look at this word, content. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 24. Rise ye up, take your journey, pass over river Anon. Behold, I've given it to thine hand, Sihon, the Amorite, the king of Eshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it. I've delivered it into your hand. Contend with him in battle. Contend, it's yours. He's sitting on it. He's holding on to it. And I've delivered it into your hand, contained in battle. He has given us the word, and the word he has given us is the word of salvation. And the word that will rescue people from the eternal lake of fire. And he says, contained, keep it pure. Let nothing, let nobody tamper with it. Keep it, defend it. Contain for it. Nehemiah chapter 13. I'm reading here from verse 15. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 15. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and leading asses as also wine, grapes, figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre, also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Verse 17, tell me there. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, saying, This must not continue on the Sabbath day. You know, the Sabbath day was delivered unto them. And they were to keep that law without anybody trying to make them compromise. And Nehemiah said, I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil sin is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath? And then he goes on. Then he tells us, Nehemiah, that chapter 13. I'm reading now from verse uh, 23. In verse 23, in those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab, and their children speak half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language. 
according to the language of the people and what did he do i contended with them they've lost the purity of the language and foreign languages ideas coming in i contended with them verse 26 did not solomon king of israel seen by these things yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his god and god made him king over all israel nevertheless even him if we're not watchful nevertheless even him if we're not contending nevertheless even him solomon the wise king did outlandish women cause to sin shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil and to transgress against our god in marrying strange wives we need to contend for that contend for that the strange women don't come into the assembly of the children of god through marrying with an equal yoke it will not happen to your children verse 28 and one of the sons of jehoiada son of eliashib the high priest was son-in-law to sambalat the horonite therefore tell me say it as if you could do that i chased him from me i chased him from me you will not be french a compromiser you will not be french a compromiser proverbs chapter 28 i'm reading from verse 4 proverbs chapter 28 reading from verse 4 earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints proverbs chapter 28 verse 4 they that forsake the law praise the wicked they praise the sinner they praise the backslider they praise the people that are not standing squally and fully and solidly on the word of god they that forsake the law praise the wicked but such as keep the law content of them content of them they don't keep quiet when they see error coming in they don't keep quiet when they see evil coming in they content jeremiah chapter 28 reading from verse 1 jeremiah 28 i'm reading from verse 1 and it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, and in the fifth month, that Ananiah, the son of Azor, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests, and in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the god of israel saying i have broken the yoke of the king of babylon within two full years will i bring again into this place all the vessels of the lord's house jeremiah had prophesied that the people of judah will spend 70 years in babylon and it's only after the 70 years when their sins have been looked into and they have repented and they are praying and they want to come back and they are not going to bring the idols of the land into Judah anymore. That's when the Lord will recall them and restore them. But this prophet said, within two years, will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon took away from this place and carried them to Babylon and I will bring again to this place Jeconiah 
the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And the prophet Jeremiah said unto prophet Ananiah in the presence of the priest and in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform the words which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Nevertheless, 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 I wish what I wish, I wish what you are saying were, were true. I wish your prophecy could be relied upon. I wish your confrontation will have any value. But look at this verse 7. Nevertheless, hear thou now the words that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence the prophet which prophesies of peace when the word of the prophet shall come to pass then shall the prophet be known that the Lord has truly sent him then Ananiah the prophet took the yoke from of the prophet Jeremiah's neck and break it Ananiah speak in the presence of all the people saying thus says the Lord even so I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon from the neck of all the nations within the space of two years he will not be corrected he was incorrigible he still stood by what he said. Jeremiah said, Ananiah, you're not speaking the truth. You're deceiving the people. Why this contention? Drop the lie. And then Ananiah, to demonstrate he was sure of what he was saying, he took the yoke of wood on the neck of Jeremiah, which he put on to demonstrate his prophecy. It will take 70 years, and the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, the prophet, after that Ananiah, the prophet, had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Ananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, that was broken the yokes of wood, but thou was made for them yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the necks of all, the, all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, and I have given him the bees of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Ananiah the prophet, Hear now, Ananiah, the Lord has not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. You're not going to help them to repent. You're telling them two years, everything will be over. You're hardening them in their sin against the Lord. You're making them to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, Ananiah, I will cast thee from up the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die. Because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Ananias the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Where did he go after death? Talk now. Where did Ananiah go after he died? He went to hell. I pray you will not teach rebellion. 
you will not teach a lie. You will not make people to believe in false doctrine, telling them whatever you do, once you are saved, you are forever saved. And the people take that and they believe the lie and they go to live in sin. And you tell people, do this, and the fellow is wondering, but it's not right. I said, do it. No consequence. Even God cannot punish you because it's me telling you to do it. You make them to trust in a lie. And you are gambling with your life. You are gambling with your eternal life. I pray none of us will continue that way. Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were reaching aforetime, they were reaching for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We will contend for the faith. Contend for the doctrine. We will not allow anyone to take the word of life eternal away from us and away from our church in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye learned and avoid them. If you know somebody who is in the habit of watering down whatever we hear from the pulpit here, if you know somebody who is in the habit of coming to you and teaching you disobedience and teaching rebellion and teaching you to water down, compromise the word of God, it says, mark them. Don't you know them? They always come. And it says, you will avoid them. For they that are such, serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. They will not deceive you. I come into Ephesians chapter 5. I read from verse 10. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove them. Tells us in Second John chapter 1, only one chapter. Second John from verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. There are people that can't stand up and look at the congregation and read the Bible and then say, this is what the Bible says, but I say, then they say a different thing. And they think they have authority to change a word, to change a verse of scripture. And they do it with bold face, as if the title of a denomination gives them authority to twist the Bible. There are many deceivers. They have entered into the world. I pray if they get to you, you'll tell them to their face, you are wrong, the Bible is right. Tell me a good amen. amen. Verse 8, look to yourselves, that we lose not the things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward, whosoever transgresses, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ as not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has 
both the Father and the Son, if there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, the faith, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speech. For he that biddeth him God's speech is a partaker of his evil deeds. I'll not be a partaker of anybody's evil deeds. Let me hear you. Point number three now. Perseveringly conserving the faith defined, described, delineated in the scriptures. Perseveringly conserving the faith that has been delivered unto us. How are we going to do that? How are we going to preserve, conserve the faith that is delivered unto us? We're looking at Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 89. Verse 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The faith settled in heaven. The doctrine is settled in heaven. The way of salvation settled in heaven. The condition of salvation settled in heaven. And the demand for holiness settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Why? It's settled in heaven. Neither shall ye diminish aught from it. Why? Because it's forever settled in heaven that she may keep the commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Verse 32, Deuteronomy chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. It's forever settled in heaven. Don't add, don't diminish. Don't take away Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. It doesn't need improvement, adjustment. Every word of God is pure. Every doctrine of Scripture is pure. It's a shield unto them that put their trust in him, add thou not unto his words. Add thou not unto his words. There are some people that like to control people's lives by what they call prophecy. They will not allow the people to rest on the word of God. Abide in the word of God. Do not allow the people to take decisions and move on in their lives by the teaching of the word of God. And they are always coming to that individual. Thus says the Lord. And the people become afraid and these uh, people tell them, I prophesied unto so and so. He didn't believe this is what happened. I prophesy to so and so, this other thing, uh, she was doubting me, this is what happened. The Lord has sent me to you now, and I know that you are a deeper life, a member, and deeper life only Bible, 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 and they want a word in Scripture, and they want to say, okay, if you are telling me that, where is it in the Bible? Well, what I'm telling you is prophecy coming from the throne of God, you'll not find this in the Bible. But if you don't obey this, and you put them under fear, judgment is coming upon those people. 
I said judgment is coming upon those people. You know, here we spend our time and then we go from verse to verse, chapter to chapter, and after we have uh, kind of searched the word and we have seen, uh, this is what the Lord has said. There is, uh, you know, somebody waiting uh, outside there and he's saying that God sent him to you to rub the belly of your wife with oil. And then once that happens, that the only time you can conceive. Uh, I'm surprised some people even do some terrible, terrible things. They said, the Lord sent me to you that that problem you have, you must drink your urine. It is when you drink your urine, you'll be free. And we don't find that. Is that in your Bible? And people who have been coming to deeper life for these many years, and they are hearing the word of God, they listen to the people that are adding and subtracting. May the Lord deliver the whole church in Jesus' name. Verse 6, Add thou not unto the words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. If somebody dies a liar, where does he go? He goes to hell. Look at Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 35. Matthew chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 35. In verse 35, here are the words of Jesus. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The words of Christ will not pass away. We are to abide in that word. I will abide in that word. You will abide in this word. You will not be swayed and you will not be driven unto false doctrine. No matter how slight that false doctrine may be, you will not go astray in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, verse 23 being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Corruptible seed will not allow people to be born again. Watered down gospel will not save people. False gospel will not save people. Of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass. And all the glory of men as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower falleth away. But the word of the Lord, tell me, endure it forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. I will not add. I will not add. I will not subtract. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues, the punishment, the devastation, the desolation, the perdition that are written in this book. And if any shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Do you believe the word of God? Do you accept the word of God? If anybody takes away from the teachings of the word of God, is trying to be lineage to the sinners, he doesn't want to talk about repentance, restitution, is trying to be lineage to the polygamists, he doesn't want to talk about one man, one wife until death do us part. He's trying to be lenient and to curry the favor of Herod. He doesn't want to say it's wrong for you to take your brother's wife. And therefore he takes away deliberately by quietness from the word of God. The Lord will take his part out of the book of life. 
the Lord will take his part out of the holy city. And the Lord will take his part out of the good things and the blessings that are written in this book. If somebody dies in that condition, and the name is out of the book of life, and the name is out of the holy city, if somebody dies in that condition, anybody can die anytime. By accident, some people die. By houses, collapses, some people die. By whatever, some people die. By the judgment of God, some people's lives are cut short because they have gone on and on to the point of no return. And the Lord says he doesn't want them to corrupt his church. He doesn't want them to hinder thousands, millions from getting to heaven. So he removes one person to save a million people. Anybody can die any time if he continues to tamper with the word of God. If somebody dies under the anger of God and the judgment of God like that, where does he go for eternity? He goes to hell. I pray that none of us here will go to hell. The Lord wants us to count his word sacred and to preach the word as he has given us. And he has given us a church to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. The grace to do it and the determination, diligence to do it and the heart to do it and the consecration, commitment to do it and do it every time the Lord will give unto you. You in particular, the Lord will give unto you you will get to heaven you will take many people to heaven and day by day as your opportunity comes declare the word of god earnestly contending for the faith once for all delivered unto the saints let's rise up and pray pray your heart out pray for the grace of god pray for the strength of the lord pray that the strength to stand God will give unto you. You will not have any friend that is so close that you fear that you cannot speak the truth because of that friend. It's not a friend who is making you to go on the way to hell. It's not a friend who wants you to dishonor God. It's not a friend who wants you to contradict the watch of God. Don't be afraid of anybody if there's any friend like that who will not allow you to stand on thus says the Lord on the totality of the whole counsel of God throw away that friend I chased him from me chase them from you and then abide in the watch of God so that you will get to heaven on the final day let nothing distract you let nothing disturb you make up your mind open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord here I am I am going to stand on the watch of God there's no deceiver there's no distractor and there's nobody that will hinder me from standing on the word of God earnestly courageously unflinchingly and uncompromisingly you want to defend the truth you want to preach the word of God you want to say oh Lord here I am I am going to be dependable I am going to be trustworthy I am going to be faithful earnestly courageously, convincingly, fervently, and purposefully, I will contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. So put your mouth and tell the Lord, you're not going to compromise. Nobody is going to run you away from ministry. And nobody is going to capture you, capture your mind, and capture your will, and capture your resolve, that you cannot contain for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You will defend the faith, and you will abide by the faith, and you will be convinced 
by the faith and you would live according to the word of God which he has delivered into our hands you will not compromise you will not compromise you will not allow anybody anybody near anybody far away a kind of friend or a kind of enemy an intimidator a persecutor anyone you are not going to allow anyone to make you bench and to make you shift your ground and to make you compromise the word of God you will stand tell the Lord you will stand tell the Lord you will stand you must stand you're a man you must stand you're a woman you must stand and with all your heart with your very blood with your life you defend this word of God that has been given unto us and you'll not allow whatever the world is promising you you will not allow whatever anybody is trying to take away from you you'll not allow anyone to make you compromise you will keep the charge you will agree with the charge earnestly 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 contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints only so can you be in favor with God only so can you get to heaven without standing and without contending and without firmly abiding in that faith once delivered unto the saints you might miss heaven this is the time for you to have the grace of god this is the time to have the strength and this is the time to have the backbone and this is the time for you to tell the lord oh lord i am going to stand Oh Lord, I'm going to stand. And Ananiah may challenge me, I will stand. A compromiser might try to challenge me, I will stand. Anyone might try to shift me from my base, I will stand. Tell the Lord, you need the grace. You need the grace to stand by all the teachings of the Word of God. All the doctrines of the Word of God. You need the grace to stand and to keep on declaring and to keep on preaching and to keep on emphasizing this is the way what ye in it this is the way show them the way show the sinners the way show the saints the way show the people of god the way this is the way what ye in it don't allow them to turn to the right or to turn to the left let them be focused on their way to heaven so that on the final day when the dead in Christ shall rise and the saints of God who have died they will rise and then those of us who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds tell the Lord tell the Lord I'll be there I'll be there I'll be there I will not miss out when the saints go marching in that prayer will be answered if you make up your mind consecrate yourself come what will whatever will happen i will i will i will earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints tell the lord i will tell the lord i will tell the lord i will earnestly earnestly zealously and seriously and uncompromisingly courageously I will stand and I'll declare the word of God at every opportunity. In my local church, I will. Over here at the headquarters church, I will. When I'm alone, I will. When there are other people, I will. Earnestly, earnestly, earnestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints.